Welcome to our review of Founders of Teotihuacan, a standalone game set in the City of the Gods. Before we start, a quick shout out and thanks to Board and Dice for sending us a review copy of this board game to check out. All right, Founders of Teotihuacan was designed by Philip Glauox. Features artwork from Chui de Leon, Odysseus, Stamoglau, and Alexander Zawada. I do apologize on my anglicized pronunciations of those. Now, it was published by Borden Dice here in North America, with copies just hitting stores earlier this month. Now, this new Tale to Walken game plays one to four players, with each game taking under an hour once you've gotten the mechanics down. Now, Founders of Tale to Walken has a $50 US MSRP. Before we go further, I just want to reiterate that this is a new standalone mm-hmm. game. While it shares the name, theme, and some of the mechanics of Teotihuacan City of the Gods, this is not an expansion, new edition, or really even a re-implementation of that game. Uh, having or knowing the original is not required to play or enjoy this game. Now, in Founders of Teotihuacan, players compete to create the best design for the City of the Gods, including its buildings, temples, and of course, the Grand Pyramid in the center of the city. Now, this is all done through a unique action selection system. You'll have to balance resource generation and building, as well as work within districts based on a tiling system where you can only build in the district your architect can see, and they're going to move around your board each round. Points are awarded for a number of things, as well as having temples that match the tiles in your central pyramid and competing the requirements of god tiles. And in the end, the builder with the most points is at the end of at most four rounds wins the game. So check out what you get in this lighter, quicker Teotihuacan game in our Founders of Teotihuacan unboxing video on YouTube. So the copy of the game I received from Board and Dice was technically a pre-release review copy. Now, it is a complete game. This was not a prototype. This was not a play test, but it was a pre-release. So what I got may not exactly match what you get in the retail copy. So when watching that unbox, you can be aware of that. Now, the one thing that I know won't match is that my copy didn't initially have enough cubes to be able to play it at four players. Now, thanks, Boards and Dice, they tossed in some extra cubes along with that game. Now, for me, these weren't actually the same color. So if you do see me sharing pics of this game or you check out of my written review, um, this isn't something that's going to happen if you pick it up. Your cubes are all going to be the same color. Also, no, who cares? Like, like they're close enough. You can easily tell the gray from the brown from the gold, even if there's slight variations between the individuals. So great to see the publisher making sure that even preview copies mm-hmm. are complete so that they can be reviewed thoroughly. It would have been easy enough for them to have just said, sorry, can't play with all player counts. Or I might be here going, what the heck? They didn't give me enough to even be able to play what's happening, which actually happened with another game recently. Now, apart from the cube problem, everything here is decent, but nothing really outstanding. Um, There's a lot of cardboard. And unlike the bigger Teotihuacan game, you aren't getting um, the -the over-the-top things. Like there were some like Mahjong-like tiles in that. You're not getting that. Instead, you've got a main market board um, that is like jigsaw fit instead of a fold. You've got individual two-sided player boards, symmetric and asymmetric sides. You've got wooden cubes and discs, uh, large wooden meeple. They're some of the biggest meeple I've ever seen that have, still have that standard meeple size and a ton of cardboard tiles. You've got uh, pyramid pieces. You've got buildings. You've got temples. You've got temple tiles. you got mass and even more. Well, now that we've got a good idea of what you get in the box, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, so to start off, you're going to pick which side of those player boards to use. Again, there's a symmetric side and an asymmetric side. Everyone uses the same side. So either everyone's all symmetric or everyone's asymmetric. There's no like, hey, you play asymmetric, I'm going to play symmetric, which would make some of it, whatever. You're going to, you're going to pick which side. You're going to take the board. You're going to take all your components of the color. Of, of your color, then you're going to put your architect meeple. It's a giant meeple on one side of your board based on where you're sitting. Then you're going to play scoring discs and favor tokens on the lowest spot on a couple of the tracks so you keep track of your score individually. And then there's a pyramid track up on the main board that you can go up. Can't have a, a one of these um, Mesoamerican themed games without a track, it seems. That seems to be part of Boards and Dice's design. Now, the central market is populated with buildings, temples, and pyramid tiles, and the sun and eclipse markers are placed on the round tracker. 
bonus discs are randomized and placed on all the action spots. And there's three different areas of the board and multiple action spots in each area. Note, the player count will affect how many of these placements go out, like how many buildings and how many discs, with less available with less players. So is there a large difference in setup for player counts or just a few items? So it's mainly the amount of stuff there is to buy. With less players, there's less to buy because there's meant to be scarcity. There's no way all the players will be able to build a four-square gold temple every turn. That's basically it. Every round, I should say. And every round, they're going to repopulate, and it's similar with that. Same with the number of action spots. With less players, there's less spots, so there's competition over those spots instead of everyone being able to go where they want every turn, which is something you actually need in an action selection game. Now, before the main game starts, everyone gets to place one of each of the three colors of pyramid tiles onto their player board, onto their central pyramid. They're going to get the associated bonus actions for those placements. More about those bonus actions in a bit. Once everyone's placed their three tiles, you now start the game. Now that you're ready to play, each round, players have a choice of placing one to three of their action discs, your little round discs, onto one of the action spaces on the market board, which again is split into three areas. Once you place it, you then decide to use that action to either build or influence. Those are the two different options. Now, the strength of that action is based on the number of discs in total on the spot after you place your disc. So action selection that not only chooses what, but how much of an action is happening. Right. And a big part of this is watching how many discs are there and waiting for other players. You have this, do I want to get there first or do I want to wait till someone else is gone? So when I go, I do more power or do I want to use three discs right away so no one can get in there? Now, at the start of each round, you're putting discs out on the spot. These are the bonus discs. And the first player to play there will get the bonus shown. Now, these include a bunch of things like getting an extra build or influence action, getting some points, increasing your power without needing extra discs, and so on. So there is a bit of a risk, or sorry, a, a, a rush to get those spots just to get those powers. Or again, do you hold back and wait till other people have taken them so that when you do take your action, it has more power? Right. But overall, you know, easy enough, more discs is more good. Yes. So if you use all your discs on a couple big actions, you might have less actions overall, which could be bad. Now, the action spots are broken into three areas, as I mentioned, and each area has a build action and an influence action. We're going to start with the building areas. So the building areas are construct a building, construct a temple, or construct your pyramid. The power determines how big a thing you can build or how many additional resources you have to pay to place them. So it's how big a building or how much additional resources to place temples or pyramid tiles. When temples or buildings are bought, they must be placed in the two districts that your architect can see. So basically the board's divided into four. You have your architect standing on one of the sides. You can only build in the two quarters of the half of the board towards your architect. Nice little mechanism so you can't just place it any open slot on your board. Yes. Now, buildings, when placed, produce resources. Buildings make resources. They're going to make cubes that match the same color as the building, either wood, stone, or gold. The actual resources go on the board, which is kind of neat, and they go into spots orthogonally adjacent to the building place. So you kind of want to place your buildings so there's lots of room around them to get resources, and you don't want to group your buildings too close or be too close to the pyramid or be too close to the edge of the board, but then you want to make sure you have room for all your buildings. So that's a whole aspect to play. Now, temples don't give you resources, but rather cost them. So that's why you're making your resources to be able to get these temples out. Now, they don't do anything with their build, but are worth points during final scoring. You want your temples to match the uh, pyramid tiles you put into play. Now, also, when you build a temple, you get to take one of the face-up temple tiles. These you can turn in later through one of the influence actions, which I'll get to in a second. Now, pyramid tiles are added to the big pyramid in the center of your board. Uh, you get bonuses for covering up certain spots, which can be can be can give you extra actions and stuff like that again. And they are worth points at the end of the game. But again, these painted pyramid tiles have to match pyramids in the same district. So you're trying to pair up your pyramid with your temples. So you need to give up some of that instant gratification during the game for your end game rewards. Correct. Now, when placing buildings and temples, you're also looking for masks. Uh, this is the most abstract part of the game that doesn't really make any sense, and I can't really tie to any real theme. Every player board is a grid, right? And some of the spots are covered by mass symbols that are in patterns. Anytime when placing a tile, no, not resources, an actual tile, on your board, if you cover up an entire mask pattern, you get a tile that masks the pattern. 
And these are worth descending points. If the first person to fill in purple gets nine points, the second person gets seven, the third gets six, and so on. So you need to, you want to be the first, but you also want to not compromise your other plans in order, just in order to get there first. Risk, yeah, so risk in a way, more. that mechanic actually kind of matches and pairs well with the action mechanic. Because again, there's a, you could rush there first to get the bonus, but you might be better off holding off because you have better things to do. And that's it. That's the three different build actions, right? Build buildings, build temples, build pyramid. Next are the influence actions. The first one lets you produce resources. Every one of your buildings in play produces one cube of resource that has to be placed on the map. No, you have to have somewhere to put it. You then get to build two single square wood or stone buildings. So it's another way to get more buildings out. And of course, if you don't have resources, that limits everything else you might yes. want to do in the game. Next influence action lets you make an offering to the gods. You turn in one of those temple tiles. Remember, every time you build a temple, you get to choose a temple tile. You get what it says in the tile. Now, there are a lot of these, and the stack actually will rotate through multiple times, and when you use it, you put it at the bottom of the stack. So there is some memory element there. And most of these will give you points for trading in resources or having certain things in play. Like, you must have three gold buildings in play if you do get five points. Now, other tiles include getting building or temples for free, where you get to build them without having to spend resources, or bonus build or influence actions. And when you get a bonus build action, you can pick any of the three builds. If you get a bonus influence, you get to pick any of the three influence actions. And you get points from any of these as well. Influence with the gods and or priests is always vital in so many cultures. Yeah, this is one of the carryovers that's in pretty much all of these T games. Now, the last influence option is gain favor. You move up a track. You get some points, and then you get the option to swap any one of those temple tiles you've collected with a face-up one. This can be useful because you might have had to take a temple tile that doesn't really fit where your strategy is going. You can swap it for one that does. So even in history, the bad stuff rolls down. You don't want to be stuck at the bottom of the period if you can make things better. <laughs> now, the round ends once every player has placed all of their action tokens, which can mean it different players end at different times. Then a new round begins. On a new round, your architect's going to walk around your city. They're going to rotate clockwise around your player board. So they're now looking at a different set of two districts. The bonus discs are re-randomized, and the board is repopulated with buildings, temples, and pyramids based on the player count. Sun token moves forward towards the eclipse token. And when they match, you now know that this next round you're going to play is the last round of the game, which is on the third round with three players or four rounds for all other player counts. Finally, and this is important, Everyone now loses one of those action discs and it goes back in the box. This is important because it means the number of available actions for every player diminishes as the game goes on. That's right. Less, not more, as you go on. The mm -hmm. exact opposite of so many games. Now, at the end of the final round, there is a big final scoring phase where every player will score their pyramid that they've been building. These points, again, are based on having the right colored temples in the same district as a similarly colored pyramid tile, with pyramid tiles higher up, scoring more points. Once everyone scored their pyramids, the player with most points wins. Plenty to do, but relatively straightforward as far as hobby games go. Now, the game also includes a solo mode where you play against the first founders. For the most part, this is a pretty typical AI with the two AI founder colors taking up action spots and removing buildings, temples, and tiles from the game instead of them taking a normal turn. And like many of these, they don't even score points. Now, what really sticks out here, though, is there are three tables that you roll on at the start of any solo game with an included D8 die. Now, these three tables give you three challenges you face during play. At the end of the game, after four rounds, it's always four, you must have completed all three challenges. If you've done that, you then look at your final score and subtract 80, and then there's a little chart that tells you how well you did based on that. That's nice and very video game-like. We have talked mm -hmm. a lot about how some board games could really take advantage of some video game concepts, and here's one that has. So now that we've got a good idea of how to play Founders of Teotihuacan, how about you share your thoughts on this lighter Teotihuacan game? So uh, really basic, simple. The, the, assuming the goal of the game, and I have to assume this is, is what it is, is to give gamers a much more accessible, lighter, easy to learn, and faster Teotihuacan game. If that's the case, which I have to assume it is, the designer and boards and dice accomplished exactly what they're setting out to do. 
that is what this is. This is Founders of Teo is a significantly more approachable than its big brother. While I wouldn't go so far as to call this a gateway game, there's far too many options and choices and things you have to keep track of and ways to score. This definitely isn't a game that's going to appeal to the uh, gateway gamer, like uh, someone who hasn't played hobby games before. But this is going to appeal to a lot more game groups than City of the Gods, which is honestly quite a monster of a game. So this is a stepping stone to cities, something to play first to learn? See, I don't think so, because what's important to note is that despite the fact they're both called Tale to Walken, there's not a lot in common with both games besides the theme. Like, really, the only crossover is the fact both boxes say Tale to Walken, and there's the same theme of you're building the same city. Now, Boards and Dice did point out this is technically earlier in the time period. So if you did want to play it, I guess you get like a whole tournament feel of here's where we're planning the city, which is supposedly what this is about, whereas the other game is about actually doing it and building it. So it's a kind of neat tie in. But mechanically, well, I guess there could be an argument that your dice level up and that's kind of like having more power and the higher level your dice are, the more you get. I could be similar to spending more discs, I guess. I, I don't know. To me, that's a pretty big stretch. This is very much a standalone game with its own mechanics, its own gameplay, and really overall feel that is different to the original. Like due to that, I, it, they really shouldn't be judged based on the other game. And I almost wonder if naming it Tail to Walking was a mistake as you can't help it. I can't help but compare these. They're both Tail to Walking games. As a reviewer, I feel like I'd be failing if I didn't compare the two, though really they are so different. It's interesting. I, I guess it really is just more about the Sun Temple and the location, Teotihuacan, as it is an iconic location. Yeah. Uh, it's a shame that it does allow for such confusion, however. I, my biggest concern is people picking this up thinking it's an expansion or not picking it up because they think it's an expansion. So trying to do my best to look at this as a completely standalone game, which again, it is. We found a lot to like. Uh, I will say the components aren't great, but they're functional. They're, there's nothing that doesn't work here. I'll admit I would have really liked some nice thick plastic. I don't know if they're plastic or Bakelite. The Mahjong-like tiles while building my pyramid. I'm sure that would have upped the cost, so that's fair. This is definitely a cheaper game than the full game. Um, the one thing that is a bit of a problem is the amount of cardboard in this box that uh, needs to be separated once you start playing. This is a game where people are going to be looking to find third-party box inserts, and I honestly don't blame them at all. Uh, the amount of components makes teardown and setup rather long for such a short game. And it's enough that I almost wonder if I'm wasting the time bagging everything because then I have to take it out. Like the, the, the sweep might actually be better and then just dump it and then spend way too long sorting it before you play. Um, I don't know. Right now I have it in baggies. Um, I, I might be considering moving to something better at some point. If, if the game keep, continues to see a lot of play, I, I may be looking to get something to control it because set up because the game's so short. If, if you are just going to plan to play a single session, it can be a bit annoying to set up. Now, what I recommend is play more than once and that kind of offsets that. So it has been released, but only just barely. So I haven't seen any inserts out there for yeah. it yet, but I'm sure it's not going to take long. Yeah, I've already seen people with their own foam core inserts that they've come up with. So it's definitely it's definitely a thing. Um, the rules here were particularly well written, easy to grasp. Um, despite the fact I totally missed a rule, but it's in there like six times. I don't know how I missed it the first time we played. First play is always extreme. That was us. Um, mechanics are easy enough to learn, uh, especially for anyone who has any experience, right? Any seasoned gamers are probably going to get all of the concepts in this really easy. Um, the one hiccup we did see at my table is the light math of figuring out how much extra you have to pay for temples and pyramid tiles based on your power something about a base cost like it costs two wood or it costs a wood and a stone plus one additional stone for every power you don't have that trips people up um some of us are great at it. i can just look at it and i get it right away i'm like yeah you have power two it's a four building you need two extra stone it's easy whereas there is one player i play with that has to ask every time like wait is it what what how much is it going to cost me like every time we played and they played three times so that definitely people can get hung up on that 
honestly, it, it does sound like something I would do. Uh, maybe keep an Excel sheet open on my phone as I play just to... <laughs> I don't know about Excel. That that seems like pushing it to seeming too hard. But like that is the basics, right? It, it's Casa. Casa wouldn't have stolen plus one extra for every power you're short. And it's that figuring out what your power level is. And I don't know. It, it's just a little bit more math to be smooth. Now, speaking of power cost, that comes from that almost auction-like action selection system which to me is the highlight of this game. This is my favorite part of Founders of Teotihuacan. Uh, what makes it sound out, stand out from other meaty Euro point salad games. I really dig the system of spending one to three actions, basically, to take your action and then getting a benefit based on how many tokens you used. I really dig that. I like this mechanic enough that I don't know if it needs to be this designer or another one, want to see another game use this at least a couple other games do something with this i really like this system i I feel like i've seen it before but again without having played it's hard to say maybe just not in such a restricted manner uh it hurts a bit more when you've got so few resources to work with each round yeah there there, we did notice that the first few games were like all in three you can't go there and then later games they're like oh and i ran out of actions and i can't do anything And later games, people were being much more cautious, tending to spend only one per action. And then there's that whole benefit of if I sit back and I can wait for other people to go, I get that benefit. And I I just, I like that decision space. Um, And it honestly flowed from, wow, this seems too powerful to, oh, no, this is too powerful to, no, actually, I think it's pretty balanced. Now, another thing I really liked was the way resource generation and spending works. I I love the fact it was all physical on your grid. Like you place a building, you physically put your resources around that building, which means you have to leave room for them. And boards get crowded in the later rounds. And then you get those tiles where like, it wants you to put out six green buildings. But if I put out six green buildings, I'm not going to have room. And I also like that spending resources actually meant taking them off your board. And again, it can matter where you take them from. Like make sure you split it up between your buildings so that that popular um, resource generation action is actually useful. And then all of this adds a rather high level of pre-planning and strategy to the game, both in what buildings you want to build, where you want to build them. And added to that, there's the architect, where you can only build in certain areas. And when you play a game with anything but three players, your architect's going to be on each side of your board once, which means you're going to be able to build in each district twice the entire game. And realizing that, knowing that last round, your architect's going to come back around and you're going to be able to build in that first zone again is a big part of the game. You literally do have to think four rounds ahead. It really is much more spatial game Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is easy to get across in a review like this and, you know, discussing it like this. So do make sure you hit up the blog after this to get a more (laughs) in-depth look at the game if what we've talked about here has piqued your interest. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get into all the different actions and what the buildings do and how your power affects them. I didn't want to do that for a video. So we do go into a lot more detail on the blog. Now, one problem with a high focus on strategy and planning is there really isn't a big tactical aspect to this game. Well, there is a decent amount of player interaction, especially with the timing of playing your action discs. And there can definitely be some hate drafting. As I mentioned earlier, there's only certain numbers of the buildings in play. And if you really need a blue temple to score and two players before you buy the two blue temples that are available, you're out of luck. Uh, the game at times, though, can feel like multiplayer solitaire. And this is a common problem in many mathy Euro games. So I can't say I'm surprised, but at least there is some interaction, yeah. which is better than some other games. Now, I will say the first play does very much feel like multiplayer solitaire because you haven't grasped all the concepts in the game and you're generally just looking at your own board. But you'll notice the more you play, the more interaction will happen, especially the hate drafting is going to start coming up. It's going to be like, oh, they're going for this. Make sure to stop. Now, one aspect of play that has had mixed results with the players I played with, though, is the scoring system. Uh, during the game, this is very much a point salad. So everything you earn, you track right away on your board, which is kind of unique because like you're collecting mass tiles with numbers on them and you're putting things over things that have very clear point spots on them. It, and the st- especially the stuff you collect, it seems odd to add that in. That to me, most games, you would add all that up at the end. But you actually track it as you're playing and you can earn a significant amount of points while playing the game, including possibly lapping the board before you've gotten to the end game scoring. But then you get to the end and you do the pyramid scoring which just feels detached from the rest of the scoring. Here you're just 
you're looking, you're doing one district at a time and you're multiplying your pyramid colors to your temple colors. And if you play well, you can get massive amounts of points if you can collect a lot of the same colored tiles and temples. And I have seen twice now the player who was in last place while playing the game, because you're tracking everything at once, scores so many points at the end, they win just because of pyramid scoring. And it just feels odd. I'm not saying it's bad or it's good, but that seems to be the, the dividing line for most of the people I played it with, what they liked or didn't like about it. It seems to be the, the deal breaker. Um, and I got to say the first couple plays again, that seems to be the shocker, the, the, Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't realize that was going to have that big an impact on the entire game. And like, we've even had a player say, well, why'd we bother playing the rest of the game? If it was all just about pyramids, um, like I, I know at least one player that thinks the only way to win is build the pyramids. I'm not convinced myself. Like we played this more than five times. I can't remember my exact play count. Might be six, might be eight, somewhere in there. I, I the pyramids do seem overpowered, but then everyone has the option to buy them. So I don't know if it's unbalanced. So how difficult is it as a result of this scoring variety, mid game and post game, to keep an eye on what your opponents are doing and sort of judge their relative score? Obviously, the scoreboard itself doesn't mm -hmm. help with that. Well, it all depends on how dedicated a gamer you are. All the information's there. It's all perfectly open. By tracking everything as you go, you know where everyone is relative to each other as you're playing, and you can do the math. Like, everyone's player boards are public info. If you look over, you can go, they have three tiles on level one, so that's three tiles, so two points per every temple they have, and they have one tile on level two, that's three points per temple they have, so in that district, they're going to score 12 points. You can do all that, but you need the right type of gamer. Like, uh, I'm sure... Um, Darkling Blight in the chat would be all over it, having everyone's counts figured out. But while you're playing, I, I, I don't play that seriously, right? I'm kind of paying attention to what everyone's doing. And what got hard, though, and here's the problem, is I can see, say, Deanna, and this isn't that hypothetical, is collecting all of the blue tiles and all the blue temples, but there wasn't anything I could do to stop it because there's only two blue temple tiles up every turn. And unless I'm first player, which also rotates. So if you're playing four players, you're each going to be first player once. I happen to be sitting next to Deanna. The only time I got the draft before her was the turn I was first. And every other time she got to go before me. And if the other players don't stop her, and it just, it became difficult to stop that strategy. Now, I think if everyone was on board, you'd be like, oh, okay, the three of us have to stop her. But by stopping her, you're taking a blue temple you probably don't want because they're going to be limited supply. I'd rather grab a red or green temple because there's lots of them because no one else is going for them. So so it's you're hurting yourself to try to stop them, which is, like I said, the, the, uh, the scoring system is the most, I would say, controversial part of this game. So overall, I really dig this game. I, I enjoy it. Um, I like quick playing games that give me that feel of playing a meteor longer game. The, the games that feel heavier than their time limit. This is definitely one of those. This is one of those games where I play it and I'm like, oh, I've, I felt like I got in a, a good Euro tonight. That was nice. Like, no, I'm not burning, burning. I'm not like, oh, I, oh, I love it. The game was so tight. And we were so close. And if I just, it's not there, but it's, it's that fulfilling one hour. Like to be able to get that feeling in one hour is always awesome to me. Now, I will admit, I prefer the original Tale to Walking. I, I definitely like the, the original, the meat of that, the rondelles, the dice, the amount of things going on that you have to track. But this is way easier to get to the table, both due to its simpler system and shorter playtime. Now, my wife, on the other hand, who tends to win, so it's not that, and who does do all that math and counting and takes way longer than everyone on her turns, um, thinks it's okay. Like, it's all right. If we say, hey, we're going to play this night, she's not going to say, oh, I'll go read a book or I'll go do something else. She'll play. But she is never going to come downstairs and say, no, we should play tonight. Founders of Temple Walk. It's, it's an okay game to her. Now, another player we play with thought this was a much better game than Tale to Walk in City of the Gods because they felt City of the Gods felt like homework. Like it was too much work. It wasn't fun. It, it, was, it was taxing. It was work versus a game. Right. 
And that's certainly going to hit uh, that point for the cer- that certain level of gamer who wants thinky, but not brain burning. That's it too. Now, I'll, one of the things that Deanna really didn't like about this game, and I think is utterly brilliant, so we're, we're totally on the different fence here, is the fact you get less actions every turn. The fact that, yeah, depending on the number of players, you either start with six or five discs. The start with five discs, that means you could t- possibly take five actions on your turn. Well, the next round, you're down to four, then the three, then the two. The last turn of the game, you only get two discs. And if you want to put those together, you only get one action. And I thought this was brilliant because as the game goes on, there's way more AP. There's way more to think about. Again, you could count up everyone's board and figure out exactly where they're at before you draft the tile to figure out, is it worth gaining 10 points for you to, or instead stealing six from Deanna? What's better? What's, what's going to win for me? And, and if I take this cube, then this cube, you could figure all that out. And what's great is that gets offset by only having two actions. So in the beginning of the game where it's pretty quick, you're like, oh, I'll take this action, then this action, then this action, then this action. And but the last round, you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Okay, I think I'm going to take that. And what I found happens is the time limit, the time for round one was about the same as round four, which I thought was brilliant. So as the complexity and depth of the game went up and, and the decision tree had branched all over the place, you only had two choices. When it was nice and it was easy, you had lots of choices. I loved it. Deanna hates it. She hated having less to do. She found it annoying at the end of the game. Like in most games, you build an engine, right? And in the last round, you want to run that big engine. Well, you can't. There's a, your engine had to have been built from the start, which again goes to that length of strategy in the game. So overall, oh, sorry. Skipped one thing, solo mode. I want to talk about that a bit. One more thing before I get to my final thoughts. I love the variable solo mode. I'm sure it's out there, but I haven't noticed it myself. The fact there are three different tables of eight goals for you. You have 512 different possible challenge combinations for solo play. I don't know anyone who's going to play this 512 times. You probably want to roll, but you could make a list of all the possible and cross them off as you played them. This is way cooler than your usual solo game of beat your high score over and over again. I love that concept. Indeed, this there's a huge thumbs up for this aspect of the game. And again, more board gamers take those take those themes and, and ideas from uh, the video game world and apply yep. them to your game just like this has. Overall, founders of Teotihuacan, I added that extra who, sorry, founders of Teotihuacan is a solid, very quick playing, midway abstract tiling euro with a very interesting action selection mechanic that has surprising depth for a game of its length. While this is not, is an expansion, a re-implementation, or a new edition of Teotihuacan City of the Gods. This is very much its own game, which should appeal to a broader range of game players. Through the reduced weight, game time, and complexity, may turn off fans of the original. I think this is going to appeal to more groups than the original did. For pretty much any group of gamers, though, for anyone who's listening right now, I personally think this is a try before you buy, which you can do on, I don't remember which, Tabletop Simulator or one of those. You can play this digitally um, or try it out at a local game store, go to a con, play a demo. Um, Definitely watch an actual play before you grab this one. Due to just how different this is from City of the Gods, I can't even just say, hey, if you like the original, pick this up. Yeah, and sadly, while some restrictions remain, it's uh, still not as easy as it once was to try before you buy. Yeah, uh, It will be interesting to see what is going to happen in the coming months and weeks and years with game stores and demo copies. Uh, which is where those digital tabletops are really coming in to fill the gap. Though I got to say, I don't like so, playing on them. It's, it's not the same not the same it's great for some games but not all of them and this is one i think i would struggle with this yeah, game you on want digital. the tactical I, I i honestly agree i think i you need that there's also nature. looking at there's also the visual i mean again yes. we're stacking things there's there's mm-hmm. a visual facial component to this game that is really hard to come across on like a, a board game arena or yep. you know one of those systems and disagree with you So gamers who I think will enjoy this game are players who dig resource management, action selection, 
combined with some special tile placement elements, like the, the restrictive tile placement. You can't just place things everywhere. In these aspects, Founders of Teotihuacan really shines. Fans of Steffenfeld style point salad games may also find a lot to like here due to its near overwhelming number of scoring options while playing. Just don't get distracted by those and totally forget about the pyramid scoring while playing. So far, I've been trying to prove it that you can win without them, but it hasn't panned out. Work with the in-game scoring, but play for the end-game scoring. Now, what this is not, despite its quick 45-minute to an hour playtime, is a gateway game. There are multiple different mechanics at work here and layered scoring systems that I think make this a game for experienced hobby gamers. Though I can totally see a group of experienced gamers teaching this to a new player, I just can't see this as something that a group just getting into board gaming should pick up without having guidance of someone who knows these mechanics well from other systems. So I wonder what a graph of complexity of name versus ease of play would look like. I suspect most gamers still not heavily into hobby and Euro games would likely struggle to buy a game they had trouble pronouncing. Yeah, Boards and Dice has a thing going. They have the T series of games and none of them. Uh, Tekenu is probably the easiest to pronounce out of all of them. But it's a thing. It's it's branding. Uh, all I will say is that Teotihuacan is actually spelled fairly close to how you pronounce it yep. when you get it right. So uh, if you and if you just do Teo, T-E-O, board game and Google it, it tends to work. All right. Before we wrap this up, I do have one other thing I want to bring up. And, and uh, Boards and Dice are probably going to hate me for this. But <laughs> the, the similarities to another game that shares a name with this game, and that is found, or part of a name, shares some words with another game, and that is Founders of Gloomhaven. While playing Founders of Teotihuacan, I couldn't help but feel like there, I, it was at least inspired by Founders of Gloomhaven. Now, since then, I've been told very clearly from the publisher and designer, this is not the case. The games are in no way related. That said, I still see a lot of similarities. The way the board is split into districts and you're building in different districts and it affects which tiles you can play in the districts. The fact that it uses polyomino buildings in the first place is one thing that's already similar. The biggest though to me is the overall flow of the game. You are building resource generation buildings to create the resources you need to build point scoring buildings. That's the core of Founders of Gloomhaven and I found the way you build buildings in order to build temples here or buildings in order to build the pyramid is very similar to me. Officially, though, the games have nothing to do with each other. Well, that's it for our review of Founders of Teotihuacan. Have you played this one? What did you think? If not, have we tempted you to pick it up? Let us know in the comments below. As mentioned earlier by Sean, I, we also invite you to check out the written review of this tile laying game. It'll be live over at tabletopbellhop.com by the time this podcast hits your ears, where I'll be going into a lot more detail about the actual gameplay and how it works, as well as sharing some picks I snapped while playing. 